There's a poem that I've read a few times. It's entitled, The, the Blind Men of Hindustan. Anybody here ever read that poem? Quite a few of us. Good. It, 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 it's, it's a poem that sticks in my mind. It comes up every now and then because it talks about six blind men who went to see the elephant. And it, it says that the first one happening to fall upon the broad and sturdy side at once began to bawl. You know, this, this wonder of an elephant is very like a wall. The next one happening to grasp the tusk declared that the elephant is very much like a spear. One fell against the leg and said the elephant is very much like a tree. One fell against the tail and said it, it's obvious, it's very much like a rope. And um, one grabbed onto the trunk and said, I can tell it's very much like a snake. And so the poem goes, and so these men of Hindustan disputed loud and long, though each was partly in the right and all, was in the, all were in the wrong. It sticks in my mind, and it sticks in my mind a lot, especially when we have religious convocations, because it seems you encounter so many ideas. And, and everybody thinks that he's absolutely right. Um, what would have been good is if somebody with eyes came along and looked at the entire elephant, and he would have had a better, better understanding of what it is like. But it reminds me of the, the, the saying, sometimes we can't see the forest because of the trees. It, it gives you the idea that sometimes we get so lost in examining the bark or the leaves or the twigs, we, we lose the concept of, of, of what this is just a part of a greater whole. And um, many times it comes to me that sometimes we, we, it happens to us. We get lost among the twigs and the leaves and the blades of grass and we lose the, the bigger picture. Sometimes we just need to elevate our minds and, and get a, a, a look at the entire picture. And then we see that the little things that we argue about or that we focus on are not really what the forest is all about at all. Now, with that preamble, you might guess that tonight I'm going to talk about something that I hope will be a bird's eye view of the forest. I hope I don't get lost among the twigs or the leaves. But I believe that what I'm going to share tonight might help to clear up some questions. I know they have cleared up some questions in my mind. I've had, I have, I've had one particular question that has been in my mind for all my life. And I only recently came up with an understanding that made sense. And I'm going, to, I'm going to begin by sharing this perplexity with you. And then near the end of my presentation, I hope I'll come up with an answer that makes sense. You know, I was, I was on Facebook. And um, a, a Christian man on one of these forums said something. He said that in the book of Job, God does not look very pretty. He was actually in some discussion with some atheists, and they were really pounding God. And he said, in the book of Job, God does not look very pretty. And, and if you think of what happens in the book of Job, I mean, God and Satan are having an argument. And then God says, look at my servant Job. And then he allows Satan, he gives Satan permission to almost destroy Job. I mean, I have four children. I don't think I could survive losing one. Job lost 10 in one day. Every single one was gone. God allowed it. Then to add insult to injury, his goods were gone. Everything he possessed was gone in one day. And his wife turned around and said, you're a fool. Why don't you curse God and die? But Job would not curse God. And then the following week or a few days later, Satan goes back in God's presence. And God allows him to come back and smite Job with a disease from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And this man says, God does not look very attractive here. And it's hard to explain why all this is a necessity. It's hard to explain why you lose 10 children in one day. And how it can be justified. But... I read another comment. Last night I told you that I'd read something from one of these atheists, and I'm going to read it. I'm not going to be talking about the same thing like I was last night, but the comment is here because it's, it's by this man, Richard Dawkins, 
who is one of the most prominent atheists in the world today. And he, he wrote a book called The God Delusion, in which he makes this comment. He says, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Of course, he believes it's fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. This is his description of the God of the Old Testament. I know that your blood boils. But I, I'm going to ask you, when you read the Old Testament, can you justifiably defend the statement? Can you defend against the statement if you read the, the Old Testament at face value? To, to show you what I mean, let me read something for you. Go with me, in fact, to Numbers 16. I'm going to read verses 25 to 33. Go with me there because I want us to read together. Numbers 16, I'm going to start at verse 25. It says, And Moses rose up and went on to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, Dathan and Abiram, on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives and their sons and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own hand, of mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. I'm sure you have puzzled sometimes about these kinds of stories in the Bible. I mean, God, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were rebels. And you might say it was justified in destroying them. But it says their children, their wives, and what else? Their little children. It wasn't just the teenagers. It was the little infants too. And Moses says, I want you to understand that if they die normally, God didn't send me. But if, they, if, if, if a new thing happens on the earth and the ground opens her mouth and swallows them, swallow them, then God sent me. Now, I don't think Satan and God were in cooperation here. I think that this, this evidence that God sent Moses came from God himself. So the ground opened, swallowed up Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, their wives, their children, and their little children as evidence that God sent Moses. One of those hard-to-control things. I think... It's things like this that Richard Dawkins reads, and he calls God uh, filicidal, pestilential, genocidal, petty, unjust, and all these words. Now, if this was a, a, a unique occurrence, you might say, there might be some way to explain it. But when you look at the Old Testament, it's a pattern, isn't it? You find a God who finds a man picking up sticks on the Sabbath day, and they bring him before Moses, and Moses says, lock him up, and I'll go and ask God what to do. And God says, you, will, you must stone him with stones until he's dead. Hard way to die for picking up a few sticks on the Sabbath. 
You find in Deuteronomy 20, verses 16 to 17, the, 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 the Israelites are entering Canaan. And here's what God says. In verses 16 and 17. But of the cities of these people which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save, no, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth. Wow. But thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Nothing that breathes was to be allowed to live. They kill every cow, every sheep, every dog, every cat, every living human being. Everything died by God's command. If you don't understand what is happening here, if you fall against probably the tail of the elephant, you're going to end up with wrong conclusions like this man has done. How do you explain this? And that is, one of, that, that is a question that had me puzzled for a very long time. And even now, I'm not going to tell you I have a perfect answer, but I have an answer that seems to make a lot of sense to me, which I want to share with you tonight. And this is why the title of my discussion tonight is Type versus Antitype. Now, what, what is a type in relation to an antitype? A type, well, let me give you a, 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 some illustrations to see if I can bring it out. I'm going to ask you to go with me to Galatians chapter 3. And um, look at verse 8. It says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, God made a promise to Abraham, and he said, all nations are going to be blessed in you. However, as we look at verse 16, a little further on in the same chapter, we see what God means. In verse 16, he says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. So this promise that God would bless all nations was through the seed of Abraham, wasn't it? Now, Paul, Paul goes to some lengths to explain. He's not talking about the, the Jews. He's not saying that all nations would be blessed and the Jews are the Hebrews or the Israelites because he says, he saith not and to seeds, plural, as of many, as though he's talking about many. But he says, as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. So he makes the point that he's not talking about God blessing all nations through the Israelites. The seed of Abraham is not the Jews contrary to what some people believe. Paul says very clearly, the seed of Abraham was one, singular. It was Christ. So God said he would bless all nations in Christ. But look at what, and look at what he says a little later on now in verse 28, 29. And if ye be Christ's, if you belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. Who is the seed of Abraham again? Christ, one seed. But if you be Christ's, if you belong to Christ, then you become a part of this seed. You are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to the promise. Now, the, who is a heir? Who is an heir? Somebody who inherits. Just go to the very next verse. The very next verse. That's the next chapter and the first verse. It says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, Differeth nothing. Where are my pictures? <laughs> okay, yes, this is what I was looking for. The heir, as long as he's a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Now, I have a picture here of a child who is under a, what is that? Under a tutor, a teacher, right? Now, this child is one day going to be this person. He's one day going to be Lord of all, according to what the Bible says. But as long as he's a child, this is how he's treated. He's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. So, this is the heir. And this is the heir. But at two different stages. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? It's two different stages of life. At one stage of life, the, the heir is treated like this. He's treated like a child. In fact, Paul says 
he's no different from a servant. Now, when you hear the word servant, you might think it means he has to work hard. No, it simply means that he's under the control of others. The main idea of, ser of being a servant here is that you don't have control over your own behavior. Somebody tells you what to do, where to go, when to go. And in fact, the word servant here is better translated slave. Is no different from a slave. Especially under conditions of slavery, you don't even decide what you're going to eat. You don't decide what you're going to wear. You don't even decide who you're going to be, to, to, to be married to when you're a slave under extreme slavery. Your master has absolute control over everything you do. That's what Paul says. When you're a child, that's how it is. And I've used this illustration before, and I'll, I'll just remind us of it. The small children in here don't even leave the room unless their parents give them permission. Man, that is bondage. That is worse than slavery. They can't even eat what they want to eat. They can't even eat when they want to eat. They have to get permission. Somebody is over them. Somebody controls their lives with absolute authority. And the Bible says this happens even for the heir. And who is the heir? He says, if you be Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to the promise. But he says, but when the heir is a child. Now, is he talking about me when I was five years old back in the 1950s? No, he's talking about the people of God. He's looking at the people of God as a body, and he's saying once we were in a state of infancy, we the people of God, and at that time we were treated like infants. We were placed under the control of something that he calls the tutor in verse 2. But is under tutors and governors. Who is a tutor? A teacher. Now go back to chapter 24. And you'll see what he's talking about because there are no chapter divisions in the original language in which the Bible was written. There are no chapter divisions. Go back to the previous verse 24, verse 24 and see what it says. It says, wherefore, the law was our what? What's another name for schoolmaster? Teacher or tutor. The law was our tutor or our teacher to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. To bring us who? Who is the us? Paul includes himself. But he's also speaking to who? Who is this, this letter addressed to? Galatians. He's talking to Galatians, Gentiles, and he's talking to of himself. Who is what? A Jew. He includes Jews and Gentiles, so obviously he's not talking about an ethnic group of people. He's speaking about Christians, God's people. He says, now, the law was our schoolmaster. We, the people of God, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. That we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. We can't isolate this from the, the following chapter where he says, when we were children, we were under tutors and governors. Go back to that chapter and see what he says. We were under tutors and governors till when? Until the time appointed by the Father. Now, the time appointed by the Father, obviously, as he says later on in verse uh, 4, the time appointed by the Father is the coming of Jesus. Because in verse 4 he says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those that were under the law. And by, when he says under the law, I understand him to mean those are, that were under the tutorship or the governorship of the law. The law was a schoolmaster. It had control of them, and they were treated like children. But the son came. When the fullness of the time came, the son arrived to deliver those that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of what? Sons! That we might be treated like sons instead of servants. And he means grown-up sons. People who have the mind of the Father and don't need to be told when to eat, what to eat, when to go, what to wear, when to come in. Because you have the mind of the Father. You don't need to be treated like a slave anymore. Slave retreatment is for children. It's for infants. That's what he's saying. Now, I wanted to say this at the beginning. Because it, 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 it is the overall foundation for what I'm going to look at in looking at type and anti-type. 
This is an illustration of type. This is an illustration of antitype. Are they the same? They look similar, but this is, this is a toy. It's not reality, is it? But it's good for a little child. It's good for a little boy. If this man starts playing with this, you take him to the psychiatrist, wouldn't you? This is good for the, the development of this. This is the stage at which, this, at which this child is. This is good for him. At this stage, something is wrong. This is good at this stage. Maybe she's even a little old. She's growing it out. But anyway, <laughs> she's at this stage. You can see she's all starry-eyed with her dog. But this is reality. There's, it, there's no comparison except that both things look similar to the superficial eye. But the person who understands realizes that there's a time when this girl needs to come to this place. She can't remain here. There comes a time when she's mature and this no longer attracts her. If it continues to attract her, her development has been stunted. She's being held back from where she really belongs. So, this is, this is an illustration of type and anti-type. Now, I want to, 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 to give you some examples, and I want you to give me the anti-type. What did this represent? Look at the board. You have on the board the lamb. Is this type or anti-type? Type. type. What is the anti-type? Thank you. That's Christ. That is the, that is the anti-type. Blood. Life. Thank you. We had sermons on it this morning. Many people, I've met people who believe that it's the literal red liquid. Pagans believe this. Catholics believe this. They believe that the priest turns the, 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 the wine in the chalice into the blood of Jesus. They believe they have to drink literal blood. They think this plasma and corpuscles and whatever else it is in it is where the power is. It's superstitious paganism. We understand the blood was only a symbol. And God gave us a clue to understand it by telling us the life of the flesh is in the blood. It represented life. When we say the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, it doesn't. It's the life of Jesus that cleanses us of sin. If you interact with that red liquid, you will never be cleansed of sin. You need to interact with the life of Jesus Christ. That's what we have been talking about since morning. It's the greatest truth in Christian theology. It's the most wonderful thing in Christian experience. It is the very life of Christ that God gives to us. That is what Christianity is. But if we, if, 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 we are, if we are locked into type, we never grasp the reality. And that is a problem that exists in many areas. Canaan. Type or anti-type? Type. Anti-type? The new earth. Heaven. The promised land, the, 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 the real promised land. So all those poor people who believe that Palestine, where the Jews and the, 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 the Muslims are fighting over, over, over real estate, fighting over real estate, and they believe that it is still sacred to God. They're still in a stage of spiritual infancy. In their understanding, they're still infants. They are locked into a system of understanding that is obsolete and outdated since 2,000 years. Physical Israel. Type or anti-type? Type of? Give me another name instead of spiritual Israel. The Christian church. The Christian church is the antitypical Israel. All who bear the name of Christ are Israel. And within that Israel, yes, you have true Israel and you have only professors. But God is going to sort it out. But by bearing the name of Christ, by taking his name, we, 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 we become a part of this great spiritual Israel that is a true antitype of what physical Israel was. Circumcision. Type. 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 The new heart new birth. and, and, and uh, the, the new birth. Yeah, the new birth. So this is why Paul could say to those Galatians, if you are circumcised, what? Christ will profit you nothing. If you are circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing because to be circumcised means that you are still living here, which means that you have not yet experienced the new birth. 
you are living in the type. You are still playing with children's toys. You have not found the reality. Can a person be saved through physical circumcision? If a person has not been born again, can he be saved? So the people who cling to the form obviously have not found the reality is what he's saying. And this is an evidence that you are still outside of Christ. You have not understood. Now, I know that some of the things that I, that, that, that I say may be striking. And I have a way of expressing myself very forcefully. And sometimes I'm misunderstood because it's, it's my way of speaking. I don't really mean to be hard on anybody if anybody here is still involved in anything that I've mentioned. I want you to understand because the only time I talk and make a lot of noise is when I'm up here. And maybe because of that, I overdo it. But I, I, I regard everybody as my brother and sister. And I felt it especially at this camp meeting. So I, 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 I feel especially close to you. And what I'm saying, I hope you'll all consider it carefully and nobody take anything personally. Now, I, I, I am beating about the bush, but I hope you'll, you'll understand what I'm saying. Because the next one that I will touch, I know it affects some people, is the feast days type or antitype. Everybody agrees it is type. What is the antitype? The events of salvation. These are the antitype. When you, when you rise up above the forest and you look down, you ask yourself, do we have two great divisions? And maybe we're getting lost in looking at the trees. And so we can't quite distinguish between those two great divisions. But if you rise up above the forest and you look, if you go back to what I was reading from Galatians, you see two great divisions in the history of God's dealings with people. One division is for the time when we were children and treated like servants. Do they overlap? That's the question I'm asking you to consider. I know some of us will say no, and some will say I'm not certain, and some might say yes. But I'm asking you to consider that carefully. Do those two great systems overlap? And if they overlap, you have muted the purity of, 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 of the truth. That's what I think. When I look at it from that perspective, I see these two great systems with no overlapping. And it helps me to understand what is happening in the Bible? Sometimes you get lost in verses. They say, okay, Paul kept the, the Passover. Paul circumcised Timothy. And then he tells the Galatians, if you are circumcised, you are going to be lost. Paul says, one man esteems one day above another. Another man says, he esteems all days alike. Let each be fully persuaded in his own mind. Why is there all this seeming confusion? That's looking at the leaves and the trees. And, they, and, 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 they, and, and looking at the elephant through blinded eyes. All those things can be sorted out, but to me the primary thing is just to get up above and look at the, the basic principle of the two great systems. This is the difference between old covenant, new covenant, type and anti-type. The letter versus the spirit. The Bible shows you these two great systems. And I'm saying... You, you know, you know, I have always taken this position that if something makes us happy and it doesn't stand against our service to God and it doesn't cause others to stumble, do it by all means. And that goes for the observing of the feast days as far as I'm concerned. But the problem I have is if somebody says to me, it is a necessity. Because if it is necessary, it means that we are still under the system of the type and I have to resist that with all my might because I believe what the Bible says makes it clear that it is no longer a necessity it's not that we still don't have a feast or two to be fulfilled I believe of course the feast of tabernacles is still to be fulfilled and so I believe also the day of atonement but the question is are we in the system 
where we are treated, we are, we are, we are controlled by the schoolmaster because that's a part of the schoolmaster's system. Or are we in a system where we are now transformed, are transferred from the bondage of servitude to sons of God, where we now deal with reality and not, not representation? That's the great question. So I want to make that clear. And I'm sweating a little bit, but after this, I'll cool down. So I can move on because that's the hard part. Somebody quoted this to me recently when we were having a discussion about the feast. So I just dropped it in there. It's from Deuteronomy 6, verses 24 and 25. And the person said, And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. And the, the, the lady quoted it to me as an evidence that we need to continue to observe these things. It, it, what, what is it that jumps out at you when you read this? Man! How, how, how can anybody avoid it? It shall be our righteousness. Absolutely. But don't you read Isaiah 64 and verse 6. What does it say? All our righteousness is ours. What? Dirty cloths, filthy rugs. Our righteousness are we still seeking our righteousness? That's what the law provides. The, the, the scripture tells us very clearly in Galatians 6 and I think verse 10, as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Because it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things that are written in the book of the law to do them. You have to do everything and you have to do it perfectly. And you have to do it from the day you are born until the day you are dead. Otherwise you are cursed. That way of righteousness is a dead end street for everybody who has ever committed one single sin. So forget it. That way of righteousness was, was, a, it was a part of the system. It never worked. Nobody ever obtained righteousness that way. And we learn afterwards that that was not God's intention either. But he does say it right there. It shall be our righteousness if we do, right? So they tried, and they tried, and they tried. But God knew all along they wouldn't, and therefore he prepared another way of righteousness sometime in the future when the seed should come. Type versus antitype. The commandments. Type or antitype? Beautiful. Some people say type. What is the antitype? God's character. Thank you. Well, it took some, say, some doing to say that. But being consistent, you, you got it out. And I agree with you absolutely. And I'm going to pro prove it to you in just a moment in a way that you can't really, really, really argue with. But let's go on a little bit and we'll come back to that. The system of the law. What is the is, that's type. What's the antitype? The spirit, good answer. I'm looking for something a little more clear, something that is stated directly in the Bible. It says, all the law and the prophets were until John, but, no, that's not the one. Go to Luke 16 and read verse 16. It says, all the law and the prophets were unto John, but since that time, what? The kingdom of God is preached. That's a new system. That's a system, of, that's a system that belongs to the Son. We are the children of the kingdom. We are the sons of the kingdom. And why are we sons of the kingdom? How I said it the first night, it's because the king is living in our hearts. We possess the life of the king. We are, we are ears of the kingdom. The, the system of the law, the antitype, is the kingdom of God. Now, let me pause a little bit and just reinforce what I'm saying by, by asking you to look at a few verses. Go to John 6, and let's read verse 32. John 6 and verse 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, 
But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. What? In the book of Psalms, it says that man ate angels' food. Speaking of the manna. But is Jesus here talking about something that goes into your mouth and into your intestine? No, he's talking about spiritual bread. And, and he says, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. What? So what Moses taught was not the truth that God wanted humanity to hear. Wow, that's a big thing to say, especially to Adventists. But how do you understand that verse otherwise? What Moses taught was not the truth that God wanted humanity to hear. In fact, when you read John 1 and verse 17, it says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What Moses brought was not grace and truth. What? Didn't Moses tell the truth? What he expressed was truth, but it was not the truth. Why does Jesus, why is, is John saying this? And why does Jesus say Moses didn't give you the true bread from heaven? Now we in this group are uniquely qualified to answer that question. You know why? Because we, we understand the purpose of the Bible and we understand the purpose of life. What is it? To take us to Christ in order that what? That? That we might have eternal life. I thought you would go the other step and say that Christ takes us to the Father. We here have been talking a lot about the Father and the Son. And, 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 the, and, and God says, Jesus says, this is life eternal. What? That they might know thee, the only true God. Did Moses cause people to know God? He did not. Moses didn't tell the truth about God. He gave a limited representation based on what he could see. What does it say in John 1 and verse 18? No man has seen God at any time. So didn't Moses see his back part? This is not talking about physical vision. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father. That's where you need to be. He has declared him. That's what Jesus is talking about. The greatest need of humanity is a revelation of God. Haven't you heard that? Don't you understand? Could Moses give us a revelation of God? He could tell you what he heard and what he saw. I've been a teacher and I know that when I tell you something, when I speak, you remember, you remember maybe 40%. When I give you a PowerPoint and I scribble things on the board, you remember maybe 60%. When I put you to work and I give you a, a, a job to do an interactive task, you might remember 80%. But when what you're involved with is your own life and experience, what you are, you don't forget. Jesus came here and he showed us his own life and experience. What he is, is what the Father was, because the Bible says he is the express image of God, what we saw here on earth when he walked here, was the truth about God. That is what Jesus means when he says, Moses did not give you the true bread from heaven. Moses gave you a picture that he himself didn't understand. Wow, so my mind is beginning to open to this genocidal God. There's something there. There's something there. And I need to look at it a little more closely. It is telling me. Because what Moses gave us is not the true bread from heaven. Jesus is where you have to go to find the truth about God. You will find it nowhere else in the Bible or in nature or in the universe. There's only one being who is the express image of God, and it is Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing God did when he gave us Jesus. Look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 1 and the first two verses. And I know you think you know where I'm going, but I'm going to surprise you. It says in verses 1 and 2, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. In the past God spoke to us by prophets. But he doesn't speak that way anymore. What? Don't we still have prophets? 
Sure we do. So why does he say that God speaks in these last days by his son, but in the past he spoke by prophets? He's speaking about this ultimate purpose of God to reveal himself. He tried to do it through Moses, Elijah, Enoch, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Daniel, Nahum, and the rest of them. He tried to speak to us to make us know him. Did it work? No, we didn't know God. So God gave us finally the greatest and final word. In these last days, he has spoken by his son. You want to know what God is like? Don't listen to Richard Dawkins. Don't look at the Old Testament to find your concept of God. Look at Jesus Christ. He is God's final word. You see the God that is creating this mayhem, killing off nations, destroying children. And you see Jesus Christ taking the babies in his hands. And he's upset because the disciples, have, the disciples try to turn them away. You look at the God who... Who, who deals with this Syrophoenician woman, this pagan, heathen woman, the God who meets the woman at the well, and he is gentle and loving. The God who meets the woman taken in adultery on the Sabbath day. If anybody deserves to be stoned, it is this woman. The Sabbath? Adultery on the Sabbath? Man, he told them to go and stone the man caught picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. What does he do to this woman taken in adultery? He writes on the ground and he says, woman, I don't condemn you. This is the truth about God. The stoning of the man with the sticks is not the truth about God. I'm not saying it was not God who gave the command. I'm not saying this. In fact, we understand that the same Jesus that we see in the New Testament was the one who was representing God in the Old Testament. So it's the same person, but why does he have these two faces? That's what I'm hoping to get to eventually. But it's two faces. And, you know, I was discussing with one of these uh, atheists, and he says, your God is a genocidal killer. And he says, the book that you believe in is, 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 is a disaster. And I said, no, the God I worship is gentle and loving and kind. I said, go and look at Jesus Christ. He said, look at the Old Testament. I said, I am a New Testament. I'm a Christian. Christianity is based on the New Testament. My religion is not based on the Old Testament. I'm not a Jew. I'm a Christian. That's what I told him. And I stand by it. I know that our religion came out of the Old Testament experience. But it came out of it. I'm not a Jew. You can judge Judaism by that. Don't judge Christianity by that. We are Christians because Jesus Christ is the one that we not only follow, but he is the life that is in us. But, of course, I'm not leaving it there because it sounds like I'm contradicting and I'm saying both things are against each other. Like I said, I'm going to come to that. Don't leave me yet. Let me go to, to another, another thing. The sanctuary service. Type or anti-type? Type. Now, I wanted to look at the anti-type of the sanctuary service, which is the ministry of Christ. Do you agree? Let's take a closer look at the sanctuary. Everything here was type. The people around were a type. They were a type of the church. You just told me. The sanctuary itself represented the ministry of Christ. Everything in the sanctuary. What, what did the altar represent? The brazen altar. What did it represent? The cross. Does it look like a cross? Does it bear any resemblance to Calvary? The lamb that was slaughtered there. Does it look like Jesus Christ? Or does the bullock or, or the goat? Nothing looks like Jesus. Even the blood represents something else. It does not resemble Calvary. It only represents Calvary. So it brings something to our mind. A type does not necessarily look like the antitype, but it resembles it in terms of some function, right? If you even go to the other one, the liver, what does this represent? Baptism. It represents the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It represents your death and your, resur your resurrection. Again, I, I suppose there's water there. So it might look like Baptism, but it actually represents Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And it does not look like resurrection. There's nobody coming to life in this. It's a symbol. And again, the point I'm emphasizing, the type does not necessarily look like the antitype, but it represents it. You need to look at the type and pick out the meaning. Many times what we have done is take the type and blow it up a few million times and transfer it to somewhere else. There are people who believe that 
Jesus has a censer in heaven today, waving about before God. There are people who believe that in heaven there's an altar where he actually ministers, literally like the priests used to do. They have simply transferred the type expanded it up a little bit, transferred it to heaven, and they think that this is what is happening. And because of this, their religion has deteriorated into just a pattern of what Judaism was. Blown up a little bit, but just as legalistic. But look at these illustrations and remember, the type and the anti-type. Especially in the sanctuary service, the things don't resemble. Each type points to some function in the ministry and the work and the experience of Christ. We move into the sanctuary itself. We go through this curtain. This curtain actually represents what? It represents, we have moved between the lever and the curtain. We have stepped from earth to heaven, right? Because the altar and the, the lever were on earth, but now, now we, we have stepped into heaven. And it doesn't look like anything in heaven. It's just a curtain, or in the case of Solomon's temple, it was marble and gold-plated walls or whatever. But... It certainly didn't look like heaven. You step in here and you see a table with 12 loaves of bread. Do you expect that there is something actually, there, there's actually a table with 12 loaves of bread in heaven? I hope not. What does the bread represent? Christ. It's, it, it, it's Christ himself who is ministering somehow through the word that is represented by this bread. And it doesn't look like the word. It looks like, it looks like 12 pieces of bread on a golden table. That's what the type is. The reality is far greater and it's not necessarily something that looks like this at all. So likewise, every implement in the sanctuary, that seven branch candlestick represented the work of the Holy Spirit through the church. Again, it's the ministry of Christ. But does Christ minister through something that looks like this? No, that, that's childish thinking. That's infantile thinking. And we certainly don't believe that. We might not know exactly how he carries out his ministry, but we understand this is representation and this is type. Similarly, the altar of incense, where they burned incense, and the incense represented the righteousness of Christ ascending with the prayers of the saints. Jesus does not burn incense today in heaven. The, 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 the religions that still believe that Jesus burned incense, burns incense are that incense is a part of the worship of God. What are they? Catholicism and Judaism. Two of the most legalistic religion, religious systems. One is one denied Christ and the other one is anti-Christ. And they are the two systems that cling the most closely to the type. They burn incense. They, 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 they still have an earthly priesthood. They still have a, a segregation between the laity and the priesthood. They, they, they still celebrate and they, they observe days and months and times and years. There's a similarity between both systems and strangely one is Antichrist and one crucified Christ. Maybe there's something there to think about. Maybe one of the reasons why they, they both, although they, 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 they have different Catholicism adopted the pagan counterparts. But the same principle of legalism and ritualistic worship prevails in both systems and where Christianity begins to regress it drifts towards one or the other now you know after this there's only one place left to go right and we go into the most holy place and we find this golden box what does this golden box represent the throne of God and what do these golden cherubim represent the angels around the throne, right? And the light there represents the presence of God. Now, I don't think, I think, I don't, under, I don't know what the throne of God is like, but I certainly don't expect it to look something like this. And I expect that the light is going to be something far, I mean, when John tried to describe what he saw in Revelation, he was at a loss of words. Ezekiel tried it. And Ezekiel said, it kind of looked like amber. And there was like a pavement under his feet. And he's, he's, he's feeling for words, but he can't quite get words to describe what he's seeing. And I still believe it was a veiled representation. This is type. The reality is far, far greater. And I don't think we can attempt to describe it. Now, inside of this box, what do we find? 
Type or anti-type? It makes no sense to say that the only thing in that system that was anti-type was the Ten Commandments. It makes no sense. If everything in the sanctuary was type, why would we say the Ten Commandments are any different? They were a representation of a greater reality. Now, the thing about the, the type, it is always true, but it is limited truth. It is not false. It is limited truth. Everything in the Ten Commandments is expressed in a limited way. Thou shalt not kill. Is that what God wants from you? No! God wants love to fill your heart so that the thought of killing or hurting anybody would never dream of entering your imagination. And you can't get that from a rule. You get that from the fact that God's life is inside of you and has transformed your nature. Your heart is filled with love. That is the meaning of the commandments. It is to have the nature of God himself through the indwelling spirit of God. The Ten Commandments are only a type. And when you limit your understanding of, of, of righteousness and morality to these ten rules, you become no better than the Jews. You become a legalist who will not walk two miles on the Sabbath, who, who, who gets up every morning and prays and reads his Bible, and he will not help the suffering neighbor down the road. Because what? Because it's Sabbath and our car punctured and you cannot work on the Sabbath. You can't fix a puncture on the Sabbath. I mean, you become so... So, so bound by the schoolmaster. If you don't hear the schoolmaster say, do this, you cannot do anything because you cannot think, you're not free to think, you're a child. You don't have the father's spirit in you. You don't have the heart of the father. You don't know how to behave if you don't have a rule to tell you how to behave. The Jews had, the Israelites had 613 of them. <laughs> Man, I wish them luck. I can't even remember, I can hardly remember 10, much less... Much more, 613, what a way to live. What a way to live. Every, every step you take, you have to be looking over your shoulders. It's so much easier to know that you're a lamb and you skip about and you frolic and you gamble. And when, when the wolf comes to destroy you, you have no desire to fight. Because you don't need to think about what you're going to do. Your nature decides for you. That's what God does for his children. He gives us a new heart and a new nature where his principles are written inside, where nobody has to come and say, do this, do this, do this. I don't need a schoolmaster because I am the living son of the living God and his life is in me and I need rules as much as God needs rules because it is his life that dominates and controls my entire existence. This is the new covenant, brothers and sisters. Paul tried hard to get it across. He said the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But it was so hard to understand. It still is hard to understand today. Let me move on a little bit. This one I know will confuse some of us a little bit. Sins is that type or antitype? It's type. What is the antitype? It's white. It must be type. Yeah, I gave it away, didn't I? I should have switched the colors a little bit. What is the antitype? Death. Sin. Who said that? Who said sin? Okay. Somebody's on my wavelength. Look at these two things. Sins, sin. Can you figure out what I'm saying? What I'm trying to say? In the Old Testament, when did you become accountable? It is when you did something wrong. You told a lie, you stole something, then you committed a sin. The problem was your individual actions. And in the new understanding of what is wrong with humanity, what is your problem? It is the sin that is in you. It is your nature that is your problem. Not what you are doing. What you are doing is a product of what you are. Your problem is that you are born carnal and you live carnal and you cannot do differently until you are born again. Sin, singular, is our problem. It is not I, but sin that dwelleth in me. Many people are still living under the old covenant understanding. Do you see why we have fights among us and why different ministries are, are, are attacking each other? Because people are saying, sins are our problem. There's only one definition of sin. And, and, and they, they're, they're trying to deal with sin by cutting off the branches of the tree. The root is sin. You, 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 that problem is solved when Jesus comes to fill your life and you are changed into the new creation. Therefore, John says, he that is born of God, what? 
does not commit sin. 1 John 3 verse 9. Because his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Then he modifies it by saying, he who abides in him does not sin. Okay, so, so he makes us know it is by faith we maintain this relationship. What about guilt? Type or antitype? Of course it's white. <laughs> What's the antitype? You commit a wrong act, you're guilty. You need to find a lamb and go kill it and get the blood, right? And then the blood makes God look at you differently. In the, in the real system, we say the problem is sin singular. Not sins plural. If sin singular is a problem, what is the equivalent of being guilty? What is the consequence of your state of sin? Death eventually, but even now while you're alive, what is the consequence when a person is in a state of sin? That would be equivalent to guilt. Separation from God. Thank you, my sister. Separation from God. They thought the problem was guilt. So how do you deal with guilt? You get a, an animal and you kill the animal and you sprinkle the blood and your guilt is solved and God no longer is angry with you. They thought that's how it worked. It was a symbol, it was a representation of a greater reality. What is the reality? You're in a state of sin and your problem is you are separated from God. What is it that cures that problem? The blood of the Lamb, which is what? The life of Jesus Christ. Do you see the picture? Do you see how every, uh, every type has a more beautiful antitype? Do you see how when you understand the gospel, you can see the gospel in the type, in shadows, vaguely. But when you look at the reality, when you compare both things, you see the reality, everything is so wonderful. God, but but if, if you get stuck in the terminology of the Old Testament, which sometimes happens in the New Testament, Sometimes they use the terminology. They say, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And some poor people think it's still literal blood. We have to translate the thing. We have to translate the types into antitype and deal with the realities. Otherwise, we remain spiritually dwarfs. Christ our substitute. That's a concept that comes again from the concept of the lamb being, being, being the the thing that takes away our problem. But instead of Christ being our substitute, we understand that Christ is what? He's our life. You got on to where I'm going. Christ is our life. And finally, I'm going to come to the final great one. In the old system, God is judge. What is he in the antitype? Some people mumbling it very quietly. Father! Father, God is our Father. We are told that Jesus taught us to call him by this new name, our Father. We are told that, this, that God has sent the spirit of his Son into our hearts, whereby we cry what? Abba, Father. You think the Jews in the Old Testament ever thought of God as their Father? They might have used the word sometimes, but they never believed it. When he came down on Mount Sinai, they begged Moses, don't let him speak to us. They were deadly scared of him, and they had a right to be. Now, why did God do this? Why does God present himself in the Old Testament in this way? I'm going to give you the one great reason, and then we're going to sort it through a little bit. Finally, I understand. The God of the Old Testament. Can you tell me what I'm going to say? The God of the Old Testament was type. The God of the Old Testament is a type. It is not the truth about God. It was a type. God represented himself in the Old Testament in a certain way because it was necessary to teach certain lessons. It was not the truth about God. Just like everything else was type, God as represented in the Old Testament was also a type. And finally, I understood it. What you see happening in the Old Testament was not reality. It was lessons. It was representations. Let me give you one example that will make it clear what I'm talking about. God had to teach them that sin is not something to be trifled with. He had to teach them that any association with sin will destroy you. What is it that kills people really? That destroys people really? Sin! Sin is the destroyer. But God had to teach the lesson. If God waits for sin to kill people, 
They will never learn how terrible sin is. God had to take the place of nature. He took the place of nature. The natural product or consequence of sin, God took upon himself to act it out. I'll give you one example to illustrate my point. Moses was God's best friend, wasn't he? He served God faithfully for 40 years. And in the 40th year, somewhere thereabouts, God said to him, speak to the rock. Moses took the stick and he hit the rock and he says, must I bring you water out of this rock? He made one little tiny mistake. God says, because you have done this, you cannot enter the promised land. Read what Moses says. He says, oh, please let me go over and see this goodly land and Lebanon. God looks at his best friend and he says, you can't. Moses goes up to, uh, to Mount Hermon. The Bible says his eye is not dim and his natural force is not abated. He is as strong as lad. Probably much stronger. His eyes are not like mine. They are keen. He's suffering from no sickness. He goes up on the mountain and he dies. God puts him to death up there. He can't go over. Why? Why is God so hard on his friend? Because God must teach the lesson that the slightest deviation is a deadly danger. The slightest association with sin is a deadly danger that can make you be lost. This is type and God must be true in the type. The type must be true. But let's move from type to anti-type. Let's move to the real system. Moses has just died. His body is hardly cold. And what happens? Here comes Michael. Right? This is reality. This is no longer type. And before they finish mourning for Moses down on the bottom, Moses is alive. And where is he? Is he? He is in heaven viewing the promised land with a far better view than any of them will ever get long before they enter the promised land. He is viewing it. He's alive. He's happy. He's rejoicing. He's eating real milk and honey. This is reality. This is not type. What is God dealing with? Grace, mercy, love. But in the type, Moses must die. Because the illustration has to tell the truth. And the illustration is talking about the effects of sin. So when I understand this, I'm going to tell you what I believe. Many of those people who were slaughtered in the Old Testament are going to receive eternal life. Just like Moses. I don't know who and how many. But I'm telling you I understand that what you see happening in the Old Testament, it is not the final truth. It was all illustration. That helped me finally to understand what was going on. Why God was so different in the Old Testament. It was illustrative. It is not the final truth, brothers and sisters. Let us wait until the final day before we make our final decisions. But when we understand the principle of type and anti-type, we can see really a reason for believing God is not really that way at all. It was lessons that were being taught. And we can say then with utter confidence that we can look at Jesus and understand what God really is and that we don't define our God or our religion from going back to the, by going back to the system of type. Praise God. That's where I'm going to end tonight. And I know that it's a mouthful, but I hope it has given you a good mouthful to think about tonight. You might see some glitches in some places because I, have no, I am not trying to pretend that this presentation has all the answers. But I hope it will satisfy some of those questions that have really been plaguing us as they plagued me for a long time. Thank you for your attentiveness. Amen. God, continue to bless you as we continue to worship. Let us pray.